This episode of Fireside Chat is brought to you by Robert Woodward, lawyer at Altador Law. He specializes in family law, wills, and estates for flame fans in Calgary and Southern Alberta. Call Robert at 403-771-2187 and mention Fireside Chat to get $100 off any legal service. Are you ready? See you, Brad. It's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. Well, we're two games into the Western Conference semifinal and not the results we're looking for. Uh, The Flames and Colorado Avalanche are now tied 1-1 in this series. As always, I'm Dan alongside Matt. Matt, did you think we'd be sitting here after the first two talking about how Mike Smith has saved our butts? Well, that's how the game plan was drawn up right from the get-go this season. Mike Smith was the MVP of the team, and he led us to the first win and nearly led us to a second win. It's you know, al- just it's- what every Flames fan expected. It's almost as though his agent called him and they're like, hey, uh, Mike, your contract's over at the end of this year and you probably won't get another one. It's like, hold my beer. Yeah. You know, like, this is not what we've seen from Mike Smith so far. It's like, I don't want to get hurt again, so I'm just going to take it easy for, like, the first few months and not, you know, play that well. And then, oh, okay, now the games matter. Time to get going. And This Riddick kid, <laughs> he looked good in that net. We should give him some more starts. Yep. Well, it was rather gentlemanly, you know. He's got to boost Riddick's career and all that. And What's a good goalie for? Well, let's take a look at these games one at a time. Uh, the first game on April 11th, the one that we we're all ex- all excited for, the first uh, home game here since we have home ice advantage. First time in a long time we've had that. Um, and we'll have home ice advantage for pretty much all the playoffs, especially if this uh, Tampa Bay series keeps going the way it looks like it's going to. And no scoring in the first, kind of a disappointing first round for the or first period for the Flames. And then they came out strong in the second and third and ended up beating the Avalanche for nothing. When I look back at this one, to me, it's a tale of two periods. Like that first period, the Flames look undisciplined. They looked flat. And then in the second period, it's like, all right, this is the Calgary Flames team that we've seen playing really well this year. Yeah, I think that the first handful of minutes even like the first half of the first period i thought the flames did a fairly decent job they were engaged physically and had a couple of chances and colorado was there i think calgary had the better first 10 minutes and then they took a bunch of calgary took a bunch of dumb penalties in quick succession and it's hard to regain flow when like you're you take a penalty, you kill it, you wait a minute and a half, then you take another penalty, kill that, take another penalty. Like, it just, it ruined the Flames' flow for, I think, from the 10-minute mark of the first period right through to about the 8 or so minute mark in the second period. And if not for some uh, good saves by Mike Smith on that second period penalty kill right off the bat, the game would have been a lot different. I guess, you know, the story of this first game is depth scoring. On Andrew Mangiapane opens the scoring, we get Backland, Kachuk, like, you know, even though that's the second line. You and I have been talking about this since pretty much January. Is That first line has got to get itself going again, and I think we may be at the end of the road for how long the depth can keep up the scoring. Like, that's why depth is important, because it can win you games in the postseason, and games that you perhaps shouldn't have won, and frankly, for like how the first line and the Jankowski line played, I don't think that, like, if the other two lines had similar efforts, that the Flames would have won that contest, but uh, that's why you need to have four lines that are decent, because they can have a good game here and there, and... uh, you know, you're instead of being down 0 2, heading into co- going to Colorado, much like Tampa Bay is uh, with Columbus, uh, the Flames at, at least are tied now in the series instead of down 0 2. I thought that in the first game here, uh, both teams played with similar intensity. I think that I was seeing a lot more physicality from Colorado than I thought we would. But I think Calgary's ability to have scoring all up and down the lineup is really what gave them that win in Game 1. Yeah, and I think that the Flames had a lot of physicality too. I think they matched it by and large. 
in game one, and they just, I think that was one of the main differences in between that and game two, is Colorado stepped up their physicality and Calgary just didn't engage at all. And you were mentioning Calgary taking some dumb penalties here in game one. If we take a look, uh, Colorado had 12 penalty minutes, Calgary had 10, and Calgary scored two goals on the power play, so two for five on the power play. And looking at how these teams are matching up and what we're seeing now, I really think whoever can play the better special teams game, and we talked a little bit about this last week, but I think whoever can play the better special teams game is going to end up winning this series. Yeah, and the penalty kill has been awesome for the Flames, and they have killed every penalty thus far through the two games, and hopefully that continues moving forward into games three and four. Anything else about game one you want to chat about? Uh, With game one, I almost feel that it was almost too easy for the Flames. And I think they got a little too cocky and overconfident and fell into the same trap that Boston and Tampa Bay did in their games. Uh, where, like, T- Tampa's like, oh, well, Columbus clearly sucks, so we're just going to win. And th- then they got up 3 nothing, and then just stopped playing, and they haven't really resumed playing yet uh, with six minutes to go in the third period of their game in Game 3. And... It's just, and Boston, like, they got embarrassed in Game 1 by Toronto. And I think that with the Flames having such a relatively easy time in Game 1, that they didn't anticipate that the other team was going to make adjustments. And I think that they got caught significantly off guard because of that. Yeah, this one I was going to talk about when we got to Game 2, but I totally agree with you. I think the Flames underestimated Colorado in game two. And we have to remember that, you know, they're still a playoff team. They're still in the best half of the league. So they're not a terrible hockey team. And I think you're right. I think the Flames came out underestimating what was in front of them. And that's a big reason why the Avalanche were able to uh, come out as strong in game two. Yeah. And you could see that the backland line was getting a little tired in that game and that they were on the ice for all three goals against and it it's frustrating because of the fact that this was a game where it seemed like Hold the Flames on, you're beat saying them. in this game, so you're talking about game two now. Yeah. Okay, uh, so we moved that, on to game two. Yeah, uh, that it seemed like the Flames beat themselves more than anything. Yeah, I don't know if I'd necessarily say that. I think the Flames came out... I thought they played better hockey in in period one of this game than they did in game one but it still wasn't good enough because Colorado still outmatched them. I think the big thing that I saw here was Colorado played a lot like what we've seen the last couple times played Anaheim in the playoffs. They were trying to be very physical. They were doing a lot of things that they shouldn't have been doing. And I think too many times our guys would try to get the extra hack on them or the extra, you know, retaliatory hit. And I think that's a lot of the reason why the Flames paraded to the penalty box so much as they did. Yeah, exactly. Like, you look at the Sam Bennett penalty. Like, he didn't need to go and punch Jost after, like, things had died down. And, yeah, Jost hit him back, but there was no call for him to do that in the first place. And that was just a careless penalty by him. It didn't end up costing the team, but... And while we... while we can play physical, that's not our game. I don't want to see the Flames running around trying to match, you know, Colorado and physicality. We need to keep playing our game, which is a fast puck moving game. And if we get off that, that's how we're going to end up. Um, and and we saw you know, that in. Winning. And we saw that in overtime. The Flames played their game, and it's just unfortunate that they didn't get one in before McKinnon ripped one home. Yeah, so I think that's, to me, game two, I think, was a lot of adjustment. Um, Yeah, and I think this was a game where you had one team that was very desperate and another that was a little overconfident in themselves. That's a good way to put it, yeah. Um, I think a big reason the Flames struggled here, as you mentioned in game one, spent far too much time in the box, and that really threw off the lineups and the matchups as well. Yeah, exactly. And you're getting guys who shouldn't be on the ice with each other, guys who, 
you know, are getting too much ice time, that's going to hurt us. And anytime any team that's prayed into the box is it's going to hurt you. But there was a lot of times here that, uh, that I was looking saying, really, do we need to take that penalty? Even like the Johnny Goudreau on, you know, uh, what was it? Embellishment penalty. That was kind of a weird call, but, um, you know, not things we need to be taken in the playoffs. No. And so I'm hoping we can settle it down before we get to Denver. Yeah, well, that, that's the thing. Like, the key it, for the Flames, if they're going to be a cup-contending caliber team, which they could be, is that they have to play and be true to themselves. Like, you, you have certain players that can bring that physical game to them. Uh, guys like Sam Bennett, Kachuk, Neil uh, uh, Hathaway. And that's great. Those guys should be doing those things. But you need to have the guys that play a certain way to not get out of their game and just do things the way that they come naturally to them. And I think that certain players were trying to do too much. And it just, like Gaudreau, he had a chance where he could have passed the puck to Monaghan in game two. And instead he took a low percentage shot because he was trying to force the play instead of looking for the pass and where Monaghan would have had a better chance to score. And it's just little things like that. Well, that... And, and on that too, I mean, if we're talking about little things, we had defense far too, far too high in the zone in this game. I remember there's one time Anderson was way down at pretty much the goal line and then the puck goes past him and it goes out of the zone. And this one I've said a number of times in the past seasons Calgary needs to keep their defensemen on the blue line so they can keep that puck playing in the offensive zone. And that was one thing I noticed a lot in game two here was Calgary's defensemen were out of position and we were constantly having to chase the puck out and then bring it back and chase it back out. And, and that chews up time on the clock. Yeah, exactly. And if you're on the power play, that eats 15, 20 seconds right there. And, uh, you're just reducing your effectiveness overall just from little mistakes. And, like, the first goal uh, by Matthew Neto, that was a classic m series of mistakes by TJ Brody where instead of doing the proper thing, which was get your body to the boards to keep the puck in or trip the guy, he just passively waved at it and then waved at the player and then... Nieto had a free, clear shot in on net and scored. And when I watched that, that goal, the first thing that came to my head was that must have been Brody because I didn't see what player it was. Like, yeah, for a guy who's playing on our top pairing, I know you and I have talked about it, but I'm not going to be upset to see this guy if he ends up leaving at the end of the year because he, more often than not, he ends up costing this team. Yeah, I think his uh, he's got to have his ice time reduced, and I think that moving forward for the rest of the playoffs, until he shows better, he should be on the third pairing. Yeah, and Anderson's, I think, proven himself good on that first pairing, so keep him there. Yeah, exactly. And if you need to swap things up for shorts, like say Anderson struggles, well, then you throw Brody back up for a few shifts. But... You know, uh, you can't have Brody, especially if he's playing like that, playing 25 minutes a night, because any of the good teams will be able to exploit him. And it was clear in that game that he was being exploited, and couple it's frustrating. couple interesting stats here. In both games, Calgary won in the faceoff circle 65 to 35%. I think that shows you how deep our, our lineup is, that we can win those against, you know, all, probably all three of their other lines if we take a look. Um, but that's that's something that Calgary needs to capitalize on a little bit more. If you're winning 65% of the faceoffs, especially if they're in offensive territory, you need to be able to set up and do something with that. And there's a few times that we'd win and we'd take a minute and Colorado would be right there and either take it off our stick or take away our options. Yeah, exactly. And Calgary... They need to start generating more shots, and that did start to happen in the overtime period. And they were, uh, I think the shots were uh, like 36 to 24 after regulation, and then it was practically tied when McKinnon scored. And 
Like, if Calgary can start generating offense and, like, throwing the puck at the net, and I think that a large portion of the Flames' struggles in Game 2 was just getting the puck into the offensive zone. Like, there was a stat after two periods that Colorado had, like, eight minutes of offensive zone time and Calgary had just north of two. And, like, that that's just ridiculous. And Calgary needs to be better if they want to win a game in the rest of the series, let alone win the series. And the the Flames need to make adjustments and show some more desperation, which was desperately lacking from the last performance. I think the good thing coming out of game two is I think we've seen the best of the avalanche. I think that's as good as they're going to get in this series. And I think the Flames now know what's in front of them. I don't think they knew that after game one. No. Well, especially because they had such a relatively easy time with the Avalanche in Game 1 that, of course, it's natural to get a little cocky and go, oh, well, that that's all you've got? Like, oh, okay. Like, who cares? Like, that's not any big deal. Like, Calgary, like, if Colorado continued to play like that, they win, Calgary wins Game 2 and probably sweeps them. But Colorado made adjustments and the Flames just weren't prepared for it. Yeah, and I mean, you and I said coming into this, it'll probably be a five-game series, and I still think it could be, and I think that's Colorado's win there. Yeah, I could see that. I think, I mean, if you look at if you look at where we're at now, it's best of five from this point, so it's the first team to win three, and I think if Calgary is motivated, and I have some reasons to believe they may not be, which we'll talk about in a second, but if these guys are motivated and play the way that they should, I think you could, I think Calgary could take two in Colorado. Yeah, I do too. And uh, just an out-of-town scoreboard, the ta- Columbus just scored to make it 3-1 with less than a minute to go. So which so game is this? Just cause Columbus, Tampa Bay. So game two? Uh, game three. Uh, Columbus okay. is going to go up 3 nothing in the series against the Tampa Bay Lightning. Just because this will be released a little bit later and we're recording, so we want people to have context. Yeah. Um. I was listening to some of the player interviews today and guys talking about the game last night. And one of the reasons I'm a little bit worried about Calgary going in is none of the players, at least to the media, have any answers of what actually went wrong. You're hearing guys like Monaghan say, we have to be better. And when pressed on, well, what has to be better? Or what do you personally have to do? It's just, we have to be better. And if you can't single out what the problem is, I don't think you can fix it. Yeah, and that this is where experience matters and the lack of it by Calgary. They have to learn that intensity and they need to be able to find that level of desperation that Colorado did. And Colorado to their credit did have does have more experience with playing desperate playoff hockey cuz they were outclassed by I think it was Minnesota last year and yet managed to push them to six games and showing that like they could handle playing against a team like that and Calgary like the last time they were in the playoffs they got swept and it was they didn't find a second gear they just sucked and it you know you can blame Elliot all you want but there was no response from anybody else on the team either and you know that's where Calgary needs to get better and like you even look back to the uh, series against Vancouver and well Vancouver was a terrible hockey team too and it, it, it was kind of like well we're better than them but they're not very good and like in the second round we were expecting to lose to Anaheim and we did and this group under Goudreau and Monaghan hasn't learned how to show any desperation or that second gear yet. And that's a bit of a disconcerting thing, but they, if they're ever wanting to actually make a deep playoff run, they have to find that within themselves, that next gear, and show that, like, yeah, I can beat you. And To me, to it's not even the next gear, because I think we've seen that gear. To me, I think it's about identifying... What needs to change? And you can't get better if you say, ah, we need to be better. I mean, 
you know, that doesn't cut it anywhere else in life. If you're driving your car and you crash into somebody and they say, what happened? No, oh, I was driving poorly, but I need to be better next time. Okay. We'll just go yeah. be better next time. Like, you know, if, if it doesn't cut it anywhere else in life, if you screw up at work or you're, you know, working in the trades, you cut off your hand and what happened? Oh, I need to be better next time. Okay. You know, like, but it, it seems to happen in hockey all the time. And, and I think that, you know, and maybe it's just they don't want to tell the media, and I can totally get that too. But you need to at some point be able to own that, you know what, I wasn't skating the way I should have, or I was out of position. Like a guy like Brody needs to at some point admit, not necessarily the media, but hopefully in the room of here's the things I did wrong, and here's yeah. what I need to do differently next time. And I think that also helps the coaches hold them accountable of, hey, TJ, you remember you said not, you're not going to do X? You're doing it, and that means you're off to the third pairing. Yeah, exactly. And it the last game it was a series of just small little mistakes that culminated in a very poor effort and it's one of those things where all of those things are easily fixable and like especially if smith continues to play like he has calgary they're a good enough team where even if they're just playing at like 60 percent and you're getting goaltending like they are from smith that should be enough to win at least games against Colorado. So, you know, it, they just need to play a lot smarter and take make less dumb decisions overall. I'm I don't want them to I don't want to get into the point where we are playing 60%. We're in the playoffs now. We need to be going 100% every game. Oh, I agree. I agree. But it you know, stuff happens. <laughs> so, but and you if you know, can't Calgary, do that, then you shouldn't be making it past first round. Yeah, exactly. And Calgary just needs to learn how to be like. It, it, you look at like last season, right? And the team was playing fairly well up until the break that they had, and they didn't have any killer instinct in their team at all and they just kind of passively went into the night and you know that season went the way it did and this year like when the flames had some adversity they rose to the occasion and and that's why they won the division and like when san jose took over top spot in march they battled back and reclaimed it and won it handily and Calgary needs to learn how to be able to elevate themselves like that when the games that now actually matter. And that, it will be the series of adjustments that I'm looking for in Game 3 and that they frankly really need to have in, in Game 3. Yeah, I agree. I think that this team has shown us they can bounce back from adversity. They can bounce back when they're struggling. And that's what they're going to need to show us next game. They need to be able to bounce back. They need to be able to say, you know what? We didn't play well and show us they can do it differently. And I'm hoping that, you know, Denver's not a long trip. It's not a different time zone. I'm hoping these guys will be fairly comfortable coming in, looking at some tape and adjusting. And I think they know, as well as we do, they need to do that in order for Game 3 to be successful. Yeah, exactly. And it's one of those things where if Calgary is playing like they can, they could easily win game three, six or seven to one. Yeah. Something I don't, like that. I don't want to you know, go that like, far. No, but they have that level of a performance in them. It, it, so like, I think they could get they, a lot of goals. I don't know. They keep Colorado to one. True. But I you mean, know what I mean? Like, again, Colorado is it's not like we're playing the Ottawa senators here. This is a team that's in the top half of the league. They made the playoffs for a reason. I think, Saying that is doing what the Flames are doing and underestimating this team. I think Colorado is a formidable opponent, and even Tampa Bay's finding that with the Blue Jackets. I think they're beatable, but I think if we expect we're going to get shutouts or you know seven one games, we're underestimating Colorado. Oh, I agree. It's just that they have that kind of a game in them if they're clicking on full cylinders, and what we we've seen in Game One and Two is not anything like that. And hopefully they can make those adjustments and play more towards that end of a game. Not necessarily running up the score like that, but, you know, just 
dominating the other team instead of being passive like they were in the first two. Yeah, it, I think this is really where we're going to find out. Um, this is where we're going to find out what this team's got. Can they get up? Can they go from here? Can they keep, you know, moving forward and upping their game and adjusting to the physicality Colorado was giving us? Or are they going to try and go out there and get angry and sort of, as we saw already, sort of, you know, take Colorado and and uh, play Colorado's way, which is getting distracted and trying to play the body? Exactly. And if we're we're playing our game our way, then there's, Colorado has no chance. But if we're getting distracted and trying to do too much, and I think that's where a lot of the problems are happening is that we're just trying to do too much with everything that uh, things will go awry. We're and trying to do too much and we're letting them get in our heads. Yep. And that happens. It, it's just you have to make the adjustments and you also have to have a little confidence in that the flames are clearly a better team than Colorado and they should be able to handle them. And so you're the better team, go out and prove it. And you know, the Colorado, it's just like the Columbus series, like Tampa Bay is clearly better than Columbus, but Columbus is like, okay, that's fine. We're just going to make you earn it. And Tampa Bay got caught flat-footed. They're down 3-0 in the series now, and they're probably going home because they didn't want it enough. And Columbus is like, well, we're already expecting to be out, so we're just going to give you as hard of a time. And now they've pushed the lightning to the brink of elimination. And, uh, you know... Calgary, I don't know if, I'm ready to compare these two series because we're not, you know, down by three. But, yeah, the team that the team that wants it more is going to win the series in most cases. And this is why it's a seven-game series is, you know, you can not do well in one, you can not do well in two. But in any series, you can't let yourself get down three games to none. And that's one thing I'm worried about with Calgary going to Denver is if, you know, the Avalanche are going to have the boost from their home fans if we don't answer the bell as they say in boxing you know then i can see this we can get down three to i think we can be down three to one fairly easily here yeah if things don't change and they don't step it up i could see that too and it and And then i'm worried i frankly i i think if it's two two heading back to calgary i'm a little worried because calgary should be able to take it to them frankly and like get out of their own way and because i think in game two it was a lot of the flames just getting in their own way if calgary can just play their game they're gonna win and we didn't see that in either of the first two games yeah no that's that's a fair way to say it I, oh it'll be interesting to see what happens monday night in game three and where the flames you know what they look like which flames team we see and with that matt let's look ahead to the next week of flames uh games we have two games, obviously, in Denver uh, coming up, and then they're back in Calgary Friday for Game 5, since we'll need at least five to settle this. Um, what lineup changes would you make if you were the Flames? I liked uh, having Sam Bennett on the first line. I think that was actually a very good decision. And I'm almost le- of the opinion of where you just take the Jankowski line and make that the fourth line where they get like seven or eight minutes a night. And bump the Ryan Mangiapane and Hathaway line to being the third line and move Lindholm onto the 3M line for a leak down to the Jankowski line. As I said, coming into this series, we had the advantage of last change. Um, so we could really use that 3M line very well against the top line if we wanted to. Going into Denver, we're not going to have that. And I think because of that, you have to break up that 3M line and put a little bit more scoring on it. And whether that's putting um, James Neal on that line or, like you said, maybe drop Elias Lindholm onto that line and put Bennett on the top line, I think well, we, I, yeah. I think I, we need to do something to m- move Froelich down into a more defensive position and have two really good scoring lines. Yeah. What are your thoughts on swapping uh, Neil for Zarnik? At this point, I'd be willing to try it for a game. Um, I, I, though I think if I was going to take somebody out, as bad as this sounds, I would take Froelich out at this point. I can see that. 
I don't think Neil has done enough wrong. In fact, I thought in game two, Neil was doing a lot right, and I don't want to take him out of lineup yet. Um, I think if I was going to take a forward out right now, it would probably be Froelich. Yeah, I can see that. So you're proposing the first line of Johnny Goudreau, Sean Monaghan, and Sam Bennett on the right? Yep. A second line of Kachuk, Backlund, and Lindholm? Yep. A third line of Monjapani, Ryan, and Hathaway? Yes. And then Jankowski, Neil, and Froelich as your fourth line? Yeah, with Zarnik being swapped in possibly for one of those two guys on the wings. Yeah, and, and again, I like that. It gives us two good scoring options, and I think we, we're not going to have... We're not going to have that ability to match up 3M, but it still gives us then, I think, looking at that two pretty good two-way lines for three and four, which is what we need. Yeah, exactly. And that they'll have a good chance to capitalize on the depth players for Colorado. Yeah. No, I like that for the forward. So really not taking anybody out. Maybe no. for a leak, but just moving some guys around. Yeah. Um, yeah, all I could think last night when I was seeing Fro League play is, you know, we'd probably be a lot better if we had Jason Zucker in that role. Yeah, I know. Which was that trade deadline deal. But, yeah, I think at this point, and, and since you got to motivate guys, I, would, I wouldn't I would take Neil out yet. I'd take Fro League out. Yeah, I can see that. And then going to the back end, any lineup changes you'd make there? Anderson first pairing, Brody third pairing. Would you keep Brody on the third pairing or would you sit him out for one? No, I'd keep him in there, uh, but using him more sparingly. So your your pairings would be Giordano and Anderson, Hannafin, Hamannick, and Fattenberg Brody. Yeah. I've been really impressed by Oscar Fattenberg, considering how little we paid for him. Um, yeah, I, I didn't agree. expect him to. I expected him to be like those guys we acquired last year, like Nick Shore and all those guys where he really didn't play at all. And I've been really impressed that he's cracked the lineup when we've got 10 defensemen here. Yeah, and he just does his thing solidly. And you don't want any drama from number six, so he doesn't bring any drama. He just does his job, and that's it. And yeah. that's all you need. I agree, and he keeps he keeps earning his way back in the lineup. I agree with your pairings. I would go the same. I'd give Anderson that first, uh, first pairing look. If it doesn't work out, I don't know. I'd go with Brody. I'd maybe try swapping Hamannick and Anderson if you feel you need a bit more veteran presence on the top pair. But I think yeah. Brody needs to stay on the third pair for at least one game. And if he, I would say if Brody's on a tight leash right now with me, if he was, if he keeps screwing up and making some of the dumb mistakes he did in, in game two, yeah, yeah, take him out, put Valimaki in, or you know Stone in if you want to, but. I think it's a good message to Brody if you actually bench him in game four, saying, you know what, we moved you down, tried to limit our exposure, you still kept screwing up, we're going to take you out for a bit. Yep, I agree. So, uh, What do you think of uh, Kale McCarr getting signed by Colorado? Do you think he has any impact on the series? So just backstory for Flames fans who may not know, he was one of their top draft picks. Well, what year was it? I'm trying to remember. That would be like 2016? Uh, same draft as Valimaki. Okay, and he's been playing in college, uh, quite highly touted prospect, been playing in college. His season is over, and now he's been uh, signed by Colorado, um, He 2017, number four overall pick. So he's been signed by the Avalanche and expected to play. I, You know my thoughts on burning a, a year with you know one or two games. I think it's, it's a dumb idea, but outside of that, I don't know that McCarr is going to make much of a difference. He's coming into playoff level hockey, which isn't just NHL hockey. It's NHL hockey on steroids. I think he might get one or two good games, but I think he's just going to be, if you look at their defenseman, he'll be a second or third pairing guy. And I think he'll be adequate in those roles. I don't think he's going to become like a, you know, the guy everyone's going to be talking about this round. Yeah. It's not like you're dropping Connor McDavid into a lineup or something like a true high end impact guy. Well, and even then, he's a defenseman, and that's a lot harder to do on the blue line is to be that, you know... Plus, he's not that he's not that big, and so you're kind of reticent to have him be exposed. Like, that, he, if I recall correctly, he's only 5'11", so it's not... Well, and I'm just not, looking at where you're going to put him. Like, you don't probably break up Gerard and Johnson. No. I don't think you break up Z Zadorov and Barry. 
No. So then he either goes in for Ian Cole or Patrick Nemeth, in which case, you know, you're playing seven minutes a game. I think he's capable of playing seven minutes a game. I don't think, you know, I don't think he's going to struggle, but he's not going to play enough to be an impact guy. No. We already see guys like Dubé struggle to adjust to the regular season. Can you imagine struggling to adjust to the playoffs? I know. And with his size, like, can you imagine him uh, having a guy like, say, Kachuk or Bennett, you know, coming in at him? Like, and he's not used to that level of hitting? Like, well, not that level of hitting, that level of speed. Like, he's not a guy who's been in the AHL playing at somewhat NHL speed. There's a guy coming out of college. Yeah. It, he could play well. Uh, it's just that, yeah. I, if it was me, I wouldn't be in a rush to play him, but... I yeah. think they're my guess, and I'm just looking here at the AHL standings. The Colorado Eagles, their farm team, are in a playoff spot. I think you get one, maybe two games out of McCarr just to showcase them to the home fans, and then you send them down to join the Eagles for their playoff run. Yeah, I could see that. I think it's, you know, a lot of it is, hey, look, here's the guy you all want to see. And I mean, how many times have we see, you know, Flames fans get, not necessarily in the playoffs, but we brought the hot guy up at the end of the year just to showcase them. And I think you might see that. But I think by the time the Avalanche come back to Calgary for game five, I wouldn't be surprised if he's down helping the Eagles with their playoff run. I could see that. And if nothing else, bring him in. Let him see what it's like to be in the playoffs. Let him run through a practice. And then it's, all right, kid, thanks for your help. Or he might stay on the roster as one of the, uh, you know, the black aces. But I think after, after he's played a couple games, I don't think he's going to have enough of a, a presence where they're going to need to keep him in the lineup. It might be travel with the team, work out with the team, but you're not on ice. We've seen that a lot from, I mean, even John Gillies is here right now and we don't expect to see him. Yeah, exactly. So I, I don't know. I think they've said McCarr is going to play. Um, yeah. I don't know if it's been official or if it's just been media talk, but I don't think you'll get more than one or two games this series. I would be hesitant to put, you know, I mean, I would even be hesitant to put Valimaki into our lineup. I think he could do it in those bottom, you know, bottom pairing minutes, but any higher than that, I wouldn't trust him either. No. So you got to be really careful. I don't think he's going to have enough minutes to, to make or break. And that's what they have to do. They have to, uh, they have to, you know, guard his, his time and what he looks like. Yeah, well, plus you don't want him getting screwed over. Like, if, like, say the Flames expose him in in a game and win because of that. Like, you don't want to ruin the guy's confidence either. So, it. So, what we should do is we should show him a bunch of TJ Brody tape and say, this is how you play defense in the NHL, kid. Yep. Um,. Goaltending for the Flames going into Colorado. You keep running Smitty? Until he starts playing bad. And he didn't play bad in the last one. He's the only reason why it wasn't a 7-2 to two game for Colorado. Yeah, no, I agree. I, I think, and I didn't think I would say this, but I think Smitty's the way to go for the foreseeable future. Yep. And it's one of those things that sometimes goalies have a great series and then are mediocre. Other times they just get on fire right through and... You know, Smith has kept the Flames in each game. Uh, until he has a bad game, I don't see any point in there being an argument on who should start. No, I think you keep running Smith the way he is. Um, outside of what we've talked about, anything else you can think of as being the keys to winning when we get to Denver? Uh, try to contain McKinnon as best as possible and uh, just have the first line get some offense going like the Gaudreau needs to get points on the board. Gaudreau. Oh, I mean, we saw Monaghan get a goal, but yeah, I think especially if we get that second line set up the way you've mentioned it, we need both those lines running. Yeah, exactly. You know, we like, need, like we need to show them that this is what depth can do for you. Well, and, and I think Colorado, I give them more credit now than I did looking at their lineup on paper going into this series. I think that they've got a few more pieces um, that maybe I underestimated, but I think we need to get out. And, and this is the one thing too. And there's a lot of jokes. I was watching the game last night with some people at a pub 
And a lot of jokes of, ah, it's the third period. We'll get going now. That's the other thing. You can't be a third period team in the Stanley Cup playoffs. We need no, to come out every early. minute. Yeah, every minute counts. Yeah, and, the, and even game one where we didn't really get things going until the second period. I think in Denver especially, we need to go out there. We need to quiet that crowd, and we got to put some early goals on the board. And that lets you then sort of play your game when you're ahead. I think Calgary's always been better when they're playing from ahead. And I think that's going to be a key, like you said, against McKinnon. If we can sort of get a buffer going, you can maybe neutralize McKinnon a bit better than if you're trying to both neutralize him and get some pucks in the net. Yeah, because like if say the Flames get up like two or three nothing, and then McKinnon scores, you're like, oh, good for you. We're gonna go score some more, have fun, uh, instead of needing to like be super on guard when he's on the ice. Another one is, I think, as I mentioned earlier from game two, just being more aware in the offensive zone of where you are and yeah. who's doing what. Like, I was cringing when I seen our defensemen at the hash marks or the goal line. Like, you guys got to stay back at the blue line. When the Flames were able to keep the puck in, we saw in the last eight minutes of the third and then in the in the overtime a little bit, when they were able to keep cycling the puck in the offensive zone, they were getting really good opportunities. But when they've got to come out and go back and come out and go back, they're wasting time and they're also breaking the flow. So I think you got to, you know, your defensemen have to be at the blue line ready to go. They can make a big shot from there, but they've got to stay near that blue line. And if they're not, the forwards need to better identify that and then they need a drop back. Somebody needs to be at the blue line. And lastly, we've got to stay out of the box. Yeah. I really think that the team, whoever can stay out of the box more in games three and four are going to win. Both teams have really good special teams in terms of power play and shorthanded. And I think whichever team can can keep playing with five men most of the game is going to be the team that's going to win. I agree. Um, I think that's probably about it for playoff stuff so far. Two games. It's, a, it's weird to say we've only got two games this week, but that's really all that's going on in Flamesland. Yeah. Um, quick side note, uh, outside the playoffs, Flames made some signings this week. No big signings. Nobody we're going to expect to see in the playoffs. This isn't a Kale McCarr scenario. Uh, the Flames signed their fourth round pick from 2017, Adam Ruzhishka. Uh, he's 19 years old from Slovakia. Uh, we've, we've talked about him at some of the rookie camps recently, but he played, um, most of, uh, t- the 2018, 2019 season in, uh, Sudbury. He uh, played 30, well, Sudbury and Sarnia, he split the season in the OHL, got 37 points with Sarnia, 41 points with Sudbury, and he also played for Slovakia, the U-20. So he's under contract. I think, I don't know about you, I think good guy to have around. I think probably career AHLer. Yeah, and he's skilled enough where at a minimum he'll be a decent foil for other players to pass the puck to and from with and... He's yeah. also, I think the way we've seen him and he's really good at making passes and I think they can turn this kid into a bit more of a, a playmaker. And I think he's the guy you're going to want on the line of whoever the next great forward is. Cause I think he could be that good AHL setup man for the next guy you're grooming to be your sniper. Yeah, I can see that. And you know, if he develops into an NHL player, awesome, but his main problem is consistency from shift to shift, game to game. And if he gets that consistency, he could be an NHL caliber talent. But uh, yeah, I agree with you. It's more likely career AHL or, but somebody decent enough to put on the top six. Yeah. I think, a, I think a guy who will have a, if he wants one and if he can get that, um, that consistency under control guy, you can make a good living playing hockey, just maybe not at the national hockey league level. Yeah. And the flames also signed KHL free agent, Artem Zagadulin. Uh, he's a decent goalie in the KHL. He's only 23, uh, had very respectable stats. Uh, he was a backup and, uh, he was in the top half of the league standings for both of goals against and save percentage and where most of the other guys are like 30 years old or older he's 23 six foot two 176 pounds catches left um if you remember there's this other goalie we have recently who we got as a european free agent um 
David Riddick, I think is his name. Um, and that's turned out pretty well for us. So, Yeah, uh, Zagadulin, I've seen a little bit of his play, and he's very composed in the net. Uh, quick up and down, uh, and just he makes himself look big on the ice, so that's good. He's solid enough positionally that I think he will eventually be an NHL player, but uh goalies are voodoo so who the heck knows <laughs> i was kind of joking about riddick because we've i mean we've had a whole bunch of guys we brought over from europe that did nothing i mean we all remember what was his name wolf castle mcbain guy david wolf and uh chervanka and all these guys and you and i kind of joked when they signed riddick oh another russian you know free agent or european free agent is going to go nowhere and riddick's turned out well and i think they well, that's wouldn't... why you keep that's why you keep throwing the dart at the dartboard eventually you're going to hit a bullseye and it, it just it, you never know and certain guys leap forward other guys don't you just don't know what you're going to get looking at our depth chart though matt bringing in another goaltender in zagadulin what do you think that spells or what do you think flames can hint from that to me i think we're going to see mason mcdonald let go at the end of the year his contract's up and i wouldn't be surprised if john gillies uh, is out of here as well I wouldn't be shocked. I would. I think McDonald probably sticks just because he had a good season. Uh, like give him another year just to see if what you saw this year so was in that just case, some then rush. You'll probably have to move either Gillies or Parsons. And I was gonna finish that by saying I think Gillies gets traded at the draft, unless the Flames think that. Riddick is their guy, and Gillies will be the backup. Then you could stick Zegadulin right into the AHL. But as it is right now, I think he's got us. I mean, we don't see a lot of guys, especially goalies, come over from Europe and go right to the NHL. And you don't want to run three goalies in the A. So something's no. got to give there. Yeah. And as much as I think John Gillies is a nice guy, um, he's he's never really looked up to snuff in the AHL. Yeah, and... Nice guy, good he, kid, serviceable goalie, but he doesn't look like a starter, even at the HL level. Yeah, it's one of those where, like, he showed flashes of potential early in his career, and then he hasn't really improved at all. And could he become an NHL goalie? Yes, but he has to take another step forward, and I... He, he played think, well to start or to finish the year, but yeah, the clock's running a little long, and that's why I wouldn't be shocked if he was included as a piece in a larger trade. Yeah, or just flip him for a pick on his own. Yeah, possibly. Um, I, w I, I think there's still organizations that would like to have Gillies. I mean, I think he's for a lot of HL teams, he'd be good. And I think being 25, like you said, there's still teams that say, well, maybe we can get some out of him. So I bet he could go somewhere. I could also see him in a Laurent Brassois type scenario. I never thought Brassois was NHL ready, but the Oilers needed somebody, and he happened to have a set of pads. So they brought him in. I could see Gillies being the backup in a an Ottawa or some crappy team like that who just you know needs a a goaltender. Yeah. Hey, yeah. you're a warm body. Well, you know, I mean, you're an NHL goalie. You've shown us you can do it. We only need you for ten, twelve games, and if you lose them, no big deal because we're a bad team, anyways. Thank you for helping our draft lottery chances. <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, pretty much. So I could see Gillies maybe getting an NHL look in a scenario like that. Um, yeah. You know, behind sort of what I always call the the 90s backup. In the 90s, we had these goaltenders like Cujo, like Broder, like Wah, who played pretty much every game. And you don't even know who their backup was half the time. Yeah. You know, like the I adventures of Craig and, Billington. Yeah, or, I mean, we had in Edmonton for Cujo, we had um, Freddie Brathwaite, and I don't even know who was behind Brodeur most of the time, and I could see it being that. It's Terreri. Like, Chris Terreri. There you go. Yeah. So, you know, we don't see a lot of that in the NHL anymore, but I think if I could see a team like an Edmonton or an Ottawa or somebody like that, um, you know, who just needs a goaltender and yeah. maybe put Gillies in that role. Yeah. So I don't think we see the last of him, but I think he might be done with the Flames. Yeah, we'll see. You know, it just, everything depends. Like, it's a little fluid just based on, because of the fact that we don't really know how this season 
has concluded and depending on how the playoffs go that changes your shopping list a bit so we'll see what uh, do you think the chances Zega Doolin becomes our NHL backup next year uh virtually zero yeah I agree like unless there's an injury it, that would pretty much be the only way even then I think of the injuries before the season when I look at the list of free agent goaltenders coming out, I think you'd be able to yeah. sign somebody else. Yeah. I think there's more guys that are going to be available than there's going to be jobs for, and I think there'll be still some guys looking for work, you know, come training camp time. So I think unless it's a mid-season injury, and even then I would see them maybe giving, as long as you stay healthy, maybe giving Parsons a look. Yeah, I agree. So I, I don't think this is an NHL signing. It's just another depth goaltender signing. Yep. Well, with that, let's look ahead to the next week. We have two games in Colorado, one on Monday, one on Wednesday, and then I guess technically three, one on Friday because we're going to be coming back to Calgary. So three games this week, two in Denver, one in Calgary. Um, we'll only talk about those ones because we don't even know if we'll need a game six. But of those three, what do you think we're looking at this week, Matt? Calgary needs to be up three to two at a very bare minimum. So you're thinking coming? You're thinking Calgary's going to take um, two of them? I, you just don't know which yeah. two. Yeah, uh, I, I would kind of lean towards them winning both in Colorado, taking their foot off the gas, and then ending it in Colorado. So you think they're going to win two in Colorado? You say take their foot off the gas on the Friday game back here in Calgary? Yeah, and then finish them off. So you think it's going to be a six-game series? Yeah. I'm going to go slightly different than you. I think Calgary's going to struggle on Monday in the first game in Colorado. I think it's going to be enough after the last game they played. I think it's going to be enough of an upper for Colorado to get another win. I think doesn't just because Calgary wins doesn't mean um, doesn't mean that they're going to lose badly. I think that they can still be very competitive, but I think Colorado is going to find a way to win, and I think Calgary's going to come back and shut them out, or shut them down in in uh, game three and game or game four and game five. Yep. So I think Calgary loses three, wins four, and wins five. Oh. Uh, but you're thinking Calgary, you said wins three and four. No, loses three and four. Wins three and four, loses five, wins six. Win, win, loss, win. All right. Well, we'll see what happens. Either way, should be good. There's no more 830 starts as it looks now. That was kind of a, a weird time uh, on Saturday. Yeah, very annoying. Especially with the overtime. And I think that honestly could have affected a lot of this too. These guys are very much creatures of habit. And I think even having that later start, 8 is hard for these guys. And then 8.30, I think, I know I was tired. Like, I wouldn't be surprised if that was part of the Flames issue. Yeah. Um, but we have at least the times for the Friday, for Game 5 Friday, Game 6 uh, Sunday and Game 7 on Tuesday if we need it haven't been announced, but at least the two in Denver are both 8 o'clock Mountain. Yep. And just want to say one last thing. Congratulations to Tiger Woods for winning the Masters. That's just awesome to see him come back and win one. There's other sports being played? Yeah. Huh. Game of Thrones returns tonight. Well, it's a sure. good thing Game of Thrones isn't returned on an NHL game night for us, for the Flames. Yeah. That's why they have picture in yeah. picture, though, if it was. Yeah. It's like, uh, which one do I just hit pause and. <laughs> I was at the bar last back. night watching the game, and they're like, oh, we're going to have two TVs running because half the bar is wanting to watch the UFC fight. And I looked around, I'm like, there's nobody here watching the UFC fight. No. Everyone that was there, I think there's one table of guys watching, and everyone else there was in their red and watching the Flames game. So uh, I guess there are other sports going on, but in this city, you probably wouldn't know it a lot of times. Yep. Well, Matt, enjoy this week, and we'll talk to you over Easter weekend, and hopefully the Flames have uh, finished the series up by then. Yep. As always, go Flames, go. Kick some butt in Denver. Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson, co-hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.